This is uh, God's word, his promise, Jeremiah 17, 14. It says, uh, Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. For you are the one I pray. Good morning, church. We pray and hope that all of you are keeping well. And over here in the leadership, every one of us have been praying for you. And we hope that if you have any particular need, be it a prayer need or even any physical assistance, do feel free to contact us and we will always be there to do whatever we can within our capacity. Before I start the, the sharing this morning, I would like to invite you all wherever you are in your houses or whichever space that you have found this morning let's look to the Lord in prayer thank you Lord for this wonderful morning and thank you Lord for watching over us we thank you that you who keep us and watch over us do not slumber neither do you sleep Lord and Lord, we thank you that you are watching over each and every one of us in the midst of this crisis situation, not only at our family or community or national level, but also at a global level. And we thank you, Lord, that your eyes are upon us, O God. Your eyes are watching us, O God, watching with love and care and protection. And we thank you, Lord, that as the Sami says in Psalms 1, 2, 1, I lift up my eyes to look to the hills. Where does my help come from? We know, Lord, that our help comes from you. Because before even we lift up our eyes to the hills and the mountains and even to the skies, your eyes have been watching, looking, and caring over each and every one of us, Lord. So we thank you this morning and even as we hear your word, we pray that you will speak to us, Lord, strengthen us, Lord, and build up our faith in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. This morning, I mean, given the situation that we are in now, um, we are basically in a state of uncertainty and a state of wondering exactly what's going to happen next. I mean, it's not just at a church level or even at a national level, globally, every government, every, 
communities that has been affected by this COVID-19 situation has been wondering what are the proper steps to be taken despite or in spite of taking of all the necessary steps that might help not only to buffer and reduce the COVID-19 situation but also to give a sense of normalcy or you know people can live their normal life given the conditions or the constraints that are around them. So this morning I would like to share based on what is relevant at this point uh, of time in our life as a church and as a community and even at a national level that is where is Christ in crisis? Where is Christ in crisis? A question that everyone asks be it a Christian or a non-Christian, be it a believer in God or, it, or an atheist, people will always ask this question, where is God? And I think if we look into the scripture as believers, we will see that we have an answer that the world probably is longing for because all the answers in the scripture has basically been encapsulated in this word, word hope and uh, I think Christ is made the hope of the world for that particular reason. So before I go on or go further or deeper into uh, this whole aspect of looking into where is Christ in times of crisis, maybe we are asking these questions. Christ Jesus is he above crisis? Is Christ in or off crisis? Is he against crisis? Or is he a transformer of crisis? Now I hope by the end of this sharing, you will see that probably a bit more clearer where Christ is in times of crisis. Now let's look a little bit into the etymology or the origin of the word crisis. Um, interestingly enough, the word crisis came at a point when the world was having a plagues and a, what you call uh, rather uh, in, I mean the spreading of infectious diseases at that time. And the word crisis in the middle uh, century, of, sorry, in the, during the um, what some would term as the dark ages yeah, uh, of the 17th, 16th, 17th century, that particular word was used to point to when a disease comes to an important juncture, that is, if you catch an infectious disease, you come to an important juncture, whether it will lead you to death or recovery. So that important juncture is called crisis. It is taken from a Greek word uh, crisis that means decision. So you've got to make a decision. You come to a decision point or a juncture. So the way we use the word crisis today is actually very much, uh, it emanates from the early 17th century when people start seeing that when you come to a point in your life or at a juncture where you have to make an important decision and that's where you are, it's a point of crisis and those decisions have to be made. So interestingly enough, the word crisis or the COVID-19 crisis somehow has got its connection with this whole medical field and it leads us to this point, where is the turning point of this particular disease of, or of this particular infectious disease? So the nature of crisis is always it's sudden. Not only sudden, it engenders fear, a lot of uncertainties and also anxieties. And sometimes we uh, have a sense of loss of control over life, over the routines in our life and even over the plans that we have made. I mean, obviously all of us can see now that we have actually lost a lot of control in some of the basic things in life due to the COVID-19 situation. Because basically this disease at a national or a global level, it's uncharted and it's also unprecedented. And uh, I think Warren Wilsby says it quite uh, appropriately, he said that after all, a crisis doesn't make a person. It reveals what a person is made of. That simply means in times of crisis, somehow 
what we hold on to, our value system, or the things that uh, we hold dear or treasure comes forth through us. And in all our little fears and anxieties, we see these things coming through. And I think this is where the Lord wants to meet us. He does not condemn us. He does not demand us to be in a situation where we think crisis in, in a situation of um, just like any other crisis in life that suddenly we think that we have to make decision all on our own. But that's not what the Lord has designed it to be since you and I belong to Him. So let me encourage you with a verse from the Bible before uh, our brother James comes and explains to you something on this little exper experiment that has been made on fear factor. But before we go on to that, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 25 to 26. Right there in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 25, uh, verses 25 to 26, it says that, Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your food from being caught. Now, if you look at uh, other translations, it's quite interesting how these words have been, uh, what you call, translated, right, to uh, convey the meaning. Uh, for example, the New Living Translation goes, I mean, translates it like this. You need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. For the Lord is your security. He will keep your food from being caught in a trap. No need to panic over alarms or surprises or predictions, says the Message Translation. That doomsday is just around the corner because God will be right there with you and will keep you safe and sound. Church, I mean, what an encouragement, yeah? What an encouragement. You know, the Sami says that, Lord, I sought you and you delivered me from all of my fears. And what he meant was, he came to a point of crisis in his life with all the fears that surrounded him and he turned to the Lord and the Lord truly delivered him. And that's what that verse in Proverbs 3 says, in times of sudden fear, do not be afraid. In times of crisis, allow me to use the word crisis. In times of crisis, do not be afraid because the Lord will be your confidence. The Lord will be by your side. By the way, the actual rendering of the word, the Lord will be your confidence, is actually the Lord will be by your side. That means He will be there with you. That's where Christ will be in times of crisis. Yes, He is above it. Yes, He can transform it. But most importantly, He is with us in every crisis situation. With that, I'd like to pass on to our brother James. Hi Church, good morning. I'm James. And uh, following up from Uncle Mark's uh, statement, uh, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, the number one thing that clouds us all is fear. And uh, I'm here just to explain to you what happens when we are facing with fear. Lah. Okay, so first of all is uh, this neuroeconomist. His name is Gregory Burns. And what he does is he uses technology to scan the brain and uh, to see how it affects you know, when they are faced with fear. And he did come out with a few pearls of wisdom that is associated with this uh, fear system. Okay? So, he relates it to uh, an experiment called the uh, Skinner Box Experiment. Okay? Uh, in this experiment, a rat or a mouse is being placed in a cage and there are flashing lights uh, in the cage. So when there's a green flashing light, the mouse receives a uh, food. But when there's a red flashing light, the cage is built with electric uh, zaps. La. So in other words, the rat gets zapped. Yeah? So red light, the rats get zapped. Green light, it's being rewarded with food. So 
it doesn't take long for the rat to associate the red, green light with a food and the red light with the zap. So it's it's same with all of us, you know. We we see things that are coming. Sometimes we the fear is not the the the, the trouble is not even there, but yet we are all fearful, and we are all uh, cowering up. And this is what is called the endowment effect. You know, what happens is when we are faced with a certain fear, before we before we want to do anything, we all cow up. You know, we we hold our we, we treasure all those that are dear to us only and we don't want to explore further you know this is the endowment effect this, which is why the economy now is not so good lah you know you can see in the papers all red 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 all the prices are dropping market price are going up you know so you know it, this is all associated with fear and people retaining themselves you know they don't want to go out to explore further. Uh, so, in other words, fear prompts retreat. You know, we all don't want to go step out further. And what the most concrete thing that neuroscientists tells us is that, you know, when we are faced with fear, we, our brain, automatically sends out these signals saying, "Hey, stop! You know, don't take on any more risks." You know, cover up yourself, just treasure all those that you love. But the first order of business is that we need to neutralize this system, this fear system. And, in our, and how do we do it as Christians? I'll leave it to Jeremy to explain it to you. Good morning, Church. I'm Jeremy. Following from what James said, how should we neutralize fear? What should we do as believers when fear grips us, when fear surrounds us? What must arise within us as believers, as Christians? Yes, I hear some of you, you said faith. According to Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. In these times of uncertainty, we need to have faith. We need to have the assurance and the conviction in the Lord Jesus Christ that all things will turn out for good. Let us look at Matthew 8 verse 23 to 26 and when he got into the boat his disciples followed him and behold there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves but he was asleep and they went and woke him saying save us lord we are perishing and he said to them why are you afraid O you of little faith then he rose and rebuked the wind and the sea and there was a great calm. I think many of us can identify with the disciples when we are surrounded by stormy seas and the winds around us when situations become unstable. We become panicked and we are fearful. But I would like to encourage each one of us you know, to, to let our faith arise. Let our faith to rise above the circumstances. Let us not be overwhelmed because Jesus is with us. He is in the boat with us. He is the anchor of our soul. He is the hope that we can hold on in. And He promised us that He will never leave us nor forsake us, especially in times of troubles like this. So let, how can our faith arise? How can our faith arise? Before that, let's look at this quote. Where faith begins, anxiety ends. And where anxiety begins, faith ends. And we need to look at how can we increase our faith during these uh, perilous times. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The phrase Word of God here uh, means Rema. Rema is the living Word where sometimes when we read the Bible, the Word of God speaks to us. The Word of God becomes real to us. And in, in, during this time of controlled movement order, I want we encourage all of us, I encourage all of us to take time to read the Bible, to meditate, no, not just to rush through. Sometimes we are busy, we just rush through our devotions with God. But the Bible says to be still and know that I am God. And even in Psalm says that be still, wait on the Lord and take courage. As we wait on the Lord, we can take courage. As we wait on the Lord, there is strength. There is strength 
there is strength for, for those who are weary, for those who are weak, for those who are anxious. You know, and those who wait on the Lord shall rise with wings like eagles. And besides uh, Bible reading, even prayer, we can also praise God, singing songs and making melody to God. Psalms 22 verse 3 says, He inhabits the praises of His people. And in Second Chronicles chapter 20, it tells us a story of Jehoshaphat, where he's surrounded by three nations and three armies surrounding him. And how did he overcome? He was fearful, but he prayed to the Lord. And his strategy was to praise, to send the musicians and the singers out in front and to sing praise to the Lord. And God came and intervened on his behalf, intervened for Israel's, for Judah's behalf. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, truly we can, there is no other, there is no other person that we need to look at. There is no other person that we can fix our hope in other than Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. In Numbers 21, verse 6 to 9, let me read. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they beat the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And the Lord prayed for the and so Moses, sorry, prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent beat anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. In John 3, verse 14, Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So at this time of um, pandemic virus, where things are, seem to, to be worse, let us look to Jesus. Let us look to Him that whoever believes in Him not only have eternal life, but will be safe from this current situation. And I pray God's blessing and God's protection upon all of you. Thank you, James and Jeremy. Appreciate your contribution. You know, just this, this other side of COVID-19 coin or this uh, viral pandemic, you know, as a community of believers, sometimes we have to see issues like this from the angle of the Word of God or probably see it from the angle of faith. I mean, you have heard just now when James covered on this experiment, the Skinner experiment that clearly depicts how the fear system can paralyze us and how faith neutralizes that fear system. And as Jeremy rightly pointed that, you know, as Moses raised the serpent on the pole and the children of Israel looked up at the serpent and they were healed because there was an instruction of the Lord unto them. And here we can see that the Lord, He Himself took the curse of sin and was on that cross. And when we look to Him and those who do not know Him yet, when they look at Him, they will find that source of faith because faith can never be manufactured. I understand that in this world, people will say, believe in yourself, believe in the things and so on. But yes, you can believe, but where does that faith comes from? What emanates faith? We know clearly Romans 10, 17 says that faith emanates from the Word of God. We cannot manufacture it because the Lord Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. It emanates from Him and He is the one who will complete it in our lives. There's another way of looking at this COVID-19 uh, situation or the other side of the coin, if I may use that expression, is that it looks to me, this is my personal observation, it looks like a forced Sabbath or a fourth sabbatical break. Uh, not only at individual level, families, communities, environment, nations, 
but even at the global level. If you look properly, people are being forced to be into an introspection condition. They've got to look to themselves. They've got to look deeper into their lives of what they value, what are the things that holds, and what are the things that they consider as priorities in their life. I mean, I've heard stories of people saying in other countries where they have been infected by COVID-19, they said that, you know, for the first time we can see the sky is blue because the factories are shut down, pollution has reduced a lot because the cars are not on the road anymore as frequently or, or, or as rapidly as it used to be. And uh, you can hear the birds now, you know, you, you can, I mean, you can hear the sound of the singing birds. They are happily, I mean, around my house, I can personally hear these birds nicely chipping around uh, what you call the area where we are living in now. And you know what? When we look at all these things, probably it could be an instruction from the Lord to slow down and start smelling the roses by the roadside for some of us. And you know, when, when after God created uh, the whole of creation, the Bible says on the seventh day, he blessed that particular day and he says that uh, on this day God will rest on the seventh day because for six days he worked. Now a lot of people will associate this with the Mosaic law or uh, with the law of Moses. But then this whole sabbatical practice was way even before uh, the law of Moses came into picture. And uh, you know this whole thing about the creation realizing that it needs to rest, probably there are just, you know, kind of a blink of light here for us during this period of time we were living that we see that maybe God is reminding us of this whole concept of rest that is needed, not just for us, but for the community, for the nation, for the environment, and for all other creation that needs rest. And then that's my observation. I, I'm not too sure whether it fits in well into a lot of other observations, but I think uh, the creation ordinance that man and woman and the creation should rest on seventh day, on the seventh day because God rested on the seventh day. So probably it's a time of introspection and a time where we can spend, as Christians, we can spend our time in a, you know, in a more quality manner I mean, qualitatively, we are spending our time with the Lord, with our families, with one another, and maybe with even our own selves. Uh, but right at, I mean, at this point of time, here in our nation, we have this particular phrase being used called social distancing. And uh, you know what? Social distancing is necessary. And as a group of believers here in Gateway, we have to adhere to all the government rulings, and all the instruction that they are giving is for our own good and for the good of the communities around us. So we have to fully adhere to it. But then the social distancing is needed so that uh, COVID-19 can be deconstructed at an even, uh, what you call, uh, faster pace. But one thing we need to take note, it's while we are dis distancing ourselves from one another, God is not included in that. He has never distanced himself from us and he will never will do so. His own way of looking at it from the Bible will be this. When the Lord Jesus was on the, was on the cross, I mean, it's rightly so that during this Paschal season or what the church calls it as the Lent season, we take time to remember all that our Lord Jesus has gone through for us before we can celebrate uh, Easter or the Resurrection Sunday. You know, when he was on the cross, he said this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken, your, forsaken me? There's another way of saying it, and this is how it goes. Probably more relevant to the time that we are living in now. My God, my God, why have you distanced yourself from me? See, what happened on the cross is that at that particular moment in time, at that particular moment in history 
on the cross, God the Father distanced himself from the Son because he bore all our sins, all our shortcomings, all our failures, sicknesses and diseases. So church, only we can believe, wrongly believe I mean, or make the wrong choice of distancing ourselves from the Lord. He is not distancing himself from us at all during this period of time. He is with us. Why? Because he has gone through that social distancing and he knows what it means. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. That's another word for social distancing. We distance ourselves from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He understands this whole process of social distancing. Now, I, I understand that in our church we have the elderly or those people who are called the seniors. Maybe you are alone in the house. Maybe uh, your children couldn't come and join you because you are overseas or outstation and, and uh, this uh, movement control order does not allow them to come back. My encouragement to you this morning would be the Lord has not distanced you. He is with you. He understands what you are going through now and the feelings that accompanies it. And He is with you every step of the way. But as a church, we are also here for you. Do let us know if you need any help and we will be there for you. Church, let me summarize what has been said uh, this morning. First of all, we need to understand. Remember I started the slide whether crisis, above crisis, in or off crisis, against crisis, or the transformer of crisis. Well, the truth is, Christ is Lord of all crisis situation. We see him above it, and when there is a crisis, he is in it. And he is against it when it comes, or it is demonically influenced. He is totally against it. There are crises that there are Basically, basically fueled by demonic forces and he is totally against it. One example you can see is what uh, our brother uh, Jeremy just now quoted, the whole experience in the Sea of Galilee when there was this uh, freak storm that came and you know this is interesting, uh, he was in the boat and yet the disciples felt that he was distancing himself from them. He was right there in the boat, right there in the crisis. And, uh, you know, church, this is important for us to understand that sometimes the Lord is, we know that He is with us and yet we have this feel or this feeling or this sensation that He is distancing Himself from us. No, He is not. And how did He handle this situation? The freak storm? He stood and rebuked it and said, peace, be still. He was against it. But He allowed it for that particular period of point or particular period of time for the disciples in order to see whether they will believe this lie that he is going to distance himself from them. So let's think about it now, all that has been said this morning, that he is going to transform this crisis situation that we are in for the glory of God. Let's look at all these things, how all these things at the end of the day can turn out for the glory of God, for us as a body of believers. Secondly, address the fear factor in and out of crisis with faith. Rightly said by James and Jeremy just now that, you know, in times of crisis, let's remember, He is our confidence. True, we cannot manufacture faith because He is our confidence. He is our, the author and that completer or the, the pioneer and the perfecter of that confidence in us. He will carry us through. And do remember of the Sabbath factor during this crisis period, God's rest. Let us rest during this period of time by looking to Him, by resting in Him. In quietness and in confidence shall be our strength. Maybe this is the point of time that we are living in, that in this quiet, on this point of Sabbath and confidence in God, we will find our strength in Him. And finally, always remember as we go through this phase or this episode in our life, as families, communities, and at national level, even at a global level, 
God did not, will not, and does not distance himself from us, neither should we. Christ has taken all that rejection on our behalf, and today we can boldly say, The Lord is with me, I shall not fear. That's what the psalmist says. Because the Lord is my shepherd, shepherd, I shall not fear. And because he's our Abba Father who cares for us, we have no fear. And what is the psalmist and the biblical characters are talking about is fear of evil. So even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil because we know our shepherd did not, will not, has not distanced himself from us. He is always with us. Church, surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Shall we close with a word of prayer, church? Thank you, Father, for your word this morning. We ask of you, Lord, that you will continue, Lord, to speak to each and every one of us, Lord, this morning. Whatever that we have heard, Lord, let faith arise in our hearts, Father. Let faith neutralize the fear system in us, around us, in this world, Father. Because, Lord, you are the author and the completer of our faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We remember all those who are not well among us. We pray that you grant them healing. And Lord, we pray especially, Lord, that you grant them strength of faith to know and to see that you are always with each and every one of us, Father. Father, we ask for your blessings upon each and every one who are hearing this message, Father, and we pray that you cause them to know, Father, that your grace is more than enough. And Lord, you are able to make all grace abound toward us, that we, having all sufficiency in all things, will always have an abundance for every good work. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. And God will make a way Where there seems to be no way He works in ways we cannot see He will make a way for me He will be my guide Hold me closely to His side With love and strength for each new day will make a way, He will make a way, oh God will make a way, where there seems to be no way, He works in ways we cannot see, He will make a way for me, He will be my God. Hold me closely to the sun With love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way By a roadway in the wilderness He'll lead me again Rivers in the desert will I see But his word will still remain, that's right, and he will do something new today.
in the name of Jesus, make a way for everyone listening today. Heal broken bodies, heal broken hearts. We choose to put our faith and our hope and our trust in you and in your word today. There is nothing that is impossible with you. And even at this moment, I believe you are working in ways that we cannot see to drive out the sickness, this virus, eradicate it in the name of Jesus. We thank you for making a way. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.